All right, this is an essay that I uh, put together a while back, and I want to share it, um, entitled, Counted Worthy to Suffer, Finding Deeper Faith. Earlier in my walk of faith, I asked God why I should worship and give him praise. The answer I got back was because he's worthy. At that particular moment, I was looking out over a very scenic, snowy landscape, which in and of itself was certainly worthy of praise. That moment aside, and all other moments, events, and circumstances withheld that are attributed to God and his worthiness to be praised, he is still worthy of praise, glory, and honor. We tend to forget this, especially when going through a difficult time. We're admonished in Scripture to count it all joy when we suffer for the cause of Christ. This isn't just when others are watching us or when we're being persecuted for our witness, though these are certainly valid. But there are times when we're going through some particular difficulty, a financial hardship or illness, and no one seems to notice or even care. Yet God and his angels see and they care. And so too does the enemy and his agents. And the enemy would like nothing more than for us to become discouraged, wagging our finger, crying out and blaming God for our woes. When the enemy hates nothing more than when we see past the illusion of our pain and suffering and find it in our hearts, the ability and yes, even the cause and purpose to praise God which in turn gives the angels cause and purpose to praise God, of which he is most worthy. Though he would slay me, yet will I praise him. Words spoken by Job, a man who suffered more in a shorter amount of time than most of us could possibly imagine losing his wealth, health, property, livestock, and children in the span of a single day. Though faithful and godly was accused by his friends of some unknown sin, then encouraged by his wife to curse God and die, probably out of her own bitter, bitterness and, and, and grief. But um, Yet he held fast to his faith and gave God the glory. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. In Romans 8, Paul reminds us, Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So great and unimaginable is that glory that Paul goes on to say, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, so much so that all of creation will be delivered from the bondage to decay through the glory that God will reveal through us, the entire universe will be renewed and restored. If you think it's counterintuitive to give praise because of suffering, when was the last time you were concerned about success? That you considered your gain to be rubbish compared to the all-surpassing knowledge of Christ? Whenever I read Philippians 2, Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being found in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. I often consider how this applies to us, that we, being in very nature wicked and evil, are by Jesus' blood made pure and holy, not so we can grasp for equality with God, but being transformed and found in his likeness, we humbly learn to be obedient even if it should mean our death. It might seem counterintuitive to glory in our suffering if we had even a minor glimpse of the immeasurable glory that we'd be partakers of. I wouldn't think it strange to ask God for more suffering, though quite unnecessary. Hardship and suffering will come all by themselves. Jesus promised we would face suffering in this world, but to take heart, for he has overcome the world. Thankfully, God has also promised not to give us more than we can handle, although it often seems that he has more faith in our capacity to handle hardship than we do in ourselves. We can be thankful that he has counted us worthy to share in his suffering, that we might be partakers of his infinite glory. When I shared this with a friend, she had a problem with referring to pain as an illusion. Her pain is real, 
and certainly the pain of the cross was real to Jesus, but due to the temporary and transitory nature of this world, I was ready to explain why I saw both pain and pleasure as illusions, as opposed to the spiritual world where everything is permanent, everlasting, eternal, and what I would see as being real. Considering how Jesus endured the flesh being ripped from his back, thorns being driven into his brow, the nails piercing his hands and feet, not to mention the weight of the world's sin oppressing him down, past, present, and future, probably equal to the, world, the weight of the world itself, that would have crushed anyone else to dust. We sometimes overlook or gloss over the fact that this was God incarnate, whose one life given, not taken, but given, would have covered the sin of more than a billion worlds. Every other day of his life, he enjoyed absolute unity with the Father, walking in perfect step with the Father's will, knowing intimately the Father's heart and speaking with authority the Father's words. Though it too was only temporary, being separated from that for even an instant must have been excruciating, and that was the real pain he suffered that day. It was, after all, the only thing that made him cry out, makes all else pale in comparison, even, dare I say, insignificant. Then it occurred to me it wasn't for nothing that Jesus gave us the cup and the bread as symbols of his physical suffering. This says to me that in light of all else, that perhaps pain as well as pleasure may not be an illusion, but still temporary nonetheless. We often will declare Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes we are healed for our physical healing. By God's will, it may apply to our temporary physical condition, but that negates what precedes it in the rest of the verse. That he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace is upon him. The sacrifice of the cross delivers us from, heals us from, the permanent suffering of hell. And there's still suffering and pain in this world, a lot of it, intended, I believe, to remind us of the consequences of sin and rebellion. How quickly we would forget the cost of the cross if we were delivered from every heartache, pain, struggle, and suffering this world pours upon us. And though we face these trials daily, Jesus encouraged us to endure, take heart, have courage, Hold on to hope, for he has overcome the world and its pain. So if he gave us the cup and the bread as symbols of his physical suffering, did he give us something as a symbol of his spiritual sacrifice? Of course he did. Absolutely he did. He gave us his spirit, the Holy Spirit. The cup and the bread can also be seen in terms of Christ being the lamb, and the spirit in terms of him being the lion. We might be tempted to believe the Holy Spirit to be the greater gift than the cup and the bread. In truth, there cannot be one without the other. He could not have given us the Spirit without first giving us the cup and the bread. Just like the intense pressure and heat that is required to make a diamond, pain and suffering is part of the purifying process that prepares us for heaven. How can we expect to be partakers of his Spirit if we haven't partaken of the cup and the bread? How can we expect to rule and reign with him if we haven't tasted of his pain and suffering? How can we be accepted as his disciples if we have not laid down our life and taken up our cross? Praise and glory and honor are his, of which he is most certainly worthy, and his mercy endures forever. So that's it. Um, Click the like if you like, and uh, be happy to get any feedback. All right, uh, leave a prayer request if you like. All right, and you guys have a great day. Take care.